Whew, that was a good laugh. Right, now to find out who won. No. Well, come on, you, you want to know who won, don't you? It's part of the game to score up, you know, just let me get on with it. No. Seriously, what's your problem? No! What? Ah, Hey folks, welcome to another Broken Meeple review. Now with games that have the prefix, the card game, I usually get a little bit worried. A lot of these big box games will suddenly, you know, they'll do so well, they'll become popular, and then people will cry out for a shorter version or the designer wants to milk a bit more of his product, and they decide to do whatever it was, the card game as a kind of way to say, here's a smaller version, or did you like the theme of this game? Well, now you can try the smaller version. A lot of the time, it doesn't tend to pay off. Does anybody remember Ticket to Ride, the card game? The uh, Castles of Burgundy, the card game? I barely hear anybody talk about that. They still play the main version. And but just generally turning, uh, Monopoly, Monopoly, the card game, was it? Monopoly Deal, the card game, horrible game. But then to be fair, the parent was horrible as well, so I don't suppose what the difference. But just generally, the card game is not something I generally want to see after a game that's already been popular. I feel like they're just milking the cash cow and trying to get a little bit more out of it. Well, today I have to look at another example. Carson City, the card game. Now, I have not played its big brother yet. You know, the big brother of Carson City. The main reason for that it's because I have it here, shrink wrap, the big box edition, I haven't got it to the table yet. So give me some chance, I will get that one reviewed in the near future. So I thought I'd tackle the card game first. You know, it's a Western theme, I'm not too fussed about, you know, I'm not a massive Western fan, I'll admit. But you don't really need to care too much about the theme to enjoy this game. But maybe I'll need to for the other one, we'll see. But the idea is, is that this is basically in that same sort of, you know, Western universe, but... Apart from that, as far as I can tell, the only similarities between this and the big box version is that you're building up a city of various buildings. What you're doing in this is you are playing a total of 18 rounds, split into two eras, so nine each, of you know, rounds, and you're playing cards that are basically just like a deck of cards numbered from 1 to 11 in your particular suit. The idea is, is that you are playing the cards to select from a central you know, tableau of city tiles and one character card. The highest card that is played in a round gets first dibs on what to pick from that tableau selection, and it goes into sending order. So the higher your card, the better a chance you have of getting something really good. Problem is, after that round is done, your card remains face up. So not only are you communicating information to your opponents, but you don't have that card for the rest of the round. Did you just use up your 11, 10, and 9? Well, you better make certain that the next six rounds of this era, you're kind of, you know, using low cards. Let's just hope you didn't want anything too great. Once the first nine rounds are done, you effectively get all your cards back, you play through a different deck of city tiles, and you do the same thing again for another nine rounds. What you are doing is you are building up a city made of these little two by two grids, as they call parcels, of land. But they basically make up your city. They'll have different icons on for various buildings and various symbols for scoring purposes. And you're trying to build your city in such a way that you can generate you know, really good combos for buildings or score a lot of points for various aspects. And believe me, there's a lot of ways to score in this game and we'll get onto that a little bit later. But once you have played through two eras, which is a round, uh, nine rounds per era, you get to the end, you score up, and what a surprise, most victory points wins. Of course! Yeah, you thought that was done and dusted. No, no, it's still there. But that's pretty much the gist of the game. It's fairly straightforward. The characters, as I mentioned, are just simply, you know, special abilities or more endgame victory points. They add a little bit of variety to the ways that you can get points, but primarily you're doing it from where you build your city. So, in all fairness, the game is actually fairly straightforward, and that's one plus of it. It's not difficult to learn the rules of this game. The, you know, the, the, the general idea of, right, I play one of these suit cards, highest gets the uh, first choice, play nine times, rinse and repeat, do another nine times, and then score. It's pretty straightforward. There's one or two little fiddly rules with, you know, how you can cover, you know, city, sp you know, city spaces that you've already played. You can overlap cards, essentially. 
But aside from that, the rules in this are generally well explained and generally pretty easy to grasp. More on that a bit later where it starts going a little bit downhill. In terms of aesthetics, it's not brilliant. This is a bit of a weakness of the game. It looks okay. I mean, the characters look fine artwork-wise, but it's not the artwork I have a problem with. I mean, there's only so much artwork here. It's a pretty sparse-looking game, a bit like the uh, Desert Wasteland, to be honest. But the graphic design has issues. The graphic design in here, I swear, what were they thinking? Firstly, I can't really show you on here. I'll have to show you a bigger picture. But uh, these cards, these suited cards, and it is basically just a, you know, 1 to, you know, 11 in your suit. And the suit can be steers, it can be horseshoes, whatever. Now, how difficult can it be to design a card like that? You need the number, preferably printed on every corner of the card. Okay, check, they've done that. Uh, you need the pictures on there for whatever suit it is, you know, for the number of times it's on there. There's a six, six symbols. Okay, perfect. Except when you look at the number and you realize they've gone for that classic kind of Western font. And oh my God, is that annoying. The amount of people I've had in this game talk about how they can barely see what cards people have played because they are face up. You're supposed to be able to see all the other players' cards that they've played, but if you've got any kind of vision problem, trying to distinguish the numbers is such a pain. The only way you can get around it is by having all your cards laid out sort of, you know, like this, in a big row. Most of the time you get people sort of stack them up like so, and it just makes it really hard to see. But the problem is you need table space for your city, so unless you want to make this a grand table hog, that's not really what you want to do, but my god does it get annoying when people are constantly having struggle looking at those numbers. And that's just the start of it. The other bad graphic design are these city tiles here. Now, obviously I'll show you a bigger picture, but the icons are clear enough in terms of the building, with one exception, more on that later. But the problem is the symbols for denoting how they score. You have got two different types on here. You've got ones that signify that you score for adjacent buildings, and you've got ones that score for that many buildings times that many symbols. The only way to distinguish them though is a slight little pointy bit around the entire symbol. That's it. At a distance, that's quite hard to see. Now bear in mind, this is not a big card. Your city can only be a total of four of these by four of these. So you're looking at quite a small space, especially when you've overlapped a few things. And there's gonna be symbols like this all over your city. So you're trying to pick out all these different scoring symbols and oh my God, is it tough on the eyes to do so. The amount of times that these things get missed and there's barely a reference guide to even tell you what they all are. Again, you know, we'll get onto that. But it just makes it really hard on the eye to play this game and it's, you know, it does get quite aggravating in that sense. So artwork is pretty basic, but when you've got these graphical design issues that's hard to see, it really does throw a bit of a spanner in the works in order to enjoy the game, or at least enjoy it that much. And worse still, I can't find an example here, but there's a location in here called uh, the drugstore. There's another one called the general store. Now, there's various locations. You can build saloons and banks and, dr and drug stores and prisons, that kind of thing. And they're all individually colored and different sculptures. So, you know, you can tell a red townhouse. You can tell apart a hotel. You know, they have the word on there, you know, so hotel's got a big banner saying hotel, but it's a unique icon. The drug store and the general store are both purple. And the only distinction that you will notice at a distance, and that's if you're good eyesight, is that one of them has a banner slightly higher up than the other that says drugstore. The other one slightly lower down that says general store. But do you honestly think the text on the card that size is particularly big? It, people get the general store and the drugstore mixed up all the time, and why didn't they just choose a different color? Really, was that too much to ask? Oy, bit of a rant there, but there's more to come. Now, Aesthetics aside, the gameplay mechanics are actually pretty sound and they are the best thing about this game. With this, it's a very enjoyable sort of 
not only hand management, because you've got to be careful, do I play my high cards early, do I play my low ones, but you're also looking at what the other opponents have already played, and their cities. So you get a new set of tiles, and there's one in there you really like, it's got two banks on it, you're gonna score for banks, it's like, I really need that tile. You look around and you see that other players have played some of their 10s and 11s, but one or two haven't. So, right, so if I play my nine, the, there's a tiebreaker rule every round for who breaks ties, but you think, I can break ties in favor. I'll play my nine, I don't have to waste my 10 11. He hasn't played his 10 or 11 though, so he could beat me, but he doesn't really care about banks. He's more after ranches, so I'll take the chance. And you choose based on that. You're making that kind of decision every round of the game and you're gonna play 18 rounds. So there's a fair amount of decision making that you're doing with this. The concept is straightforward, just play the card, but you'd be surprised how you know much decision and thinking you have to do to sort of try and psych out your other players as to thinking, is he gonna play a high card so he can grab that character or grab that particular tile? Do I need to waste one of my high cards? Is there anything there of interest? Can I afford to chuck away my one and two because I'm not too fussed which one I get? You know, looking at other people's cities is key to making that decision. On top of this, you're building a city in front of you using these cards. Now, it would be a bit, a bit boring if you literally just went, you know, like that all the time. So one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four. But no, with this, you can actually overlap cards. So if there's an empty space on there, you can overlap it so that it covers up the empty space. But you can also replace like for like with buildings and there's one or two other exception rules that allow you to replace stuff on top of other things. Like, you know, if there's two mountains here and two mountains there, you can overlap them with each other and sometimes that benefits you in scoring. So it, it makes houses closer to other things that like to be in close proximity to the houses, that kind of thing. So your city never looks like a boring four by four grid. It's this smorgasbord of, you know, different overlapping cards and tiles all over the shop. You've got all the different buildings. It looks quite neat on the table. And again, not aesthetically, you know, grandeur. It's pretty basic, but it, it looks cool. And everybody ends up with a very different looking city, particularly if they've decided to focus on a particular aspect of the game. One player might be really interested in getting the ranches. They like to have empty space around them for more points. So you look at their cityscape and it's practically a wilderness, you know, like literally like a desert wasteland, but they've got lots of ranches. Good for points, but it looks very different from my city, for example, where I'm getting lots of banks because not only do I have a character that gives me more points for banks, but I've also got a lot of houses. Banks like to be close to houses, as do my drugstores. Okay, great. I can you know, worry about having a very sort of, in, not industrial, what's the word I'm looking for? You know, a big residential city full of houses and full of banks. So I've gone down like the economy route <laughs> in a weird way. And there's other ways you can do it. You know, you've got you know, the prisons to keep um, outlaw minus penalties out to check. You've got mines that are great for the mountain symbols. You've got a few other ones like saloons and that, which primarily care about houses. I mean, houses are certainly one of the most important things you should get in your city, but they do score in slightly different ways. And the characters add even more variety through end game scoring. So mechanically, I like the way this plays, but, there's a big couple of caveats here. Firstly, game length. Did they just outright lie on this box? This game says, one to six players, 30 to 45 minutes. Now, every time a game says a flat length of time with such a wide player count, you know that something's up when you get a lot of players in this game. And this is no exception. 30 to 45 minutes, how? You might be able to do this with solo or maybe two, probably two. Three or more, mm, dubious at three, four, very doubtful, five and six, impossible. I've had a game of this go on for 90 minutes with six players. And some of that is just the fact that you've got a lot of gameplay going on. Yeah, you're playing these auction cards simultaneously, but you can still take a while in order to get through those 18 rounds, particularly in your first couple of games where you're not quite certain what you're doing. But I'll get on to the main reason why it can take a while longer anyway. And you might think, well, there's only two of you. It can't be that bad, right? Except in this game, you have to use virtual players. 
If you play with anything less than four players, you must bump up the figure to four by use of virtual players. And you can bump it up to six by including virtual players. You have the option, so there's a bit of variety in how you tweak the game. But a virtual player is literally shuffle one of the auction decks, put it face down, and every round it flips over. You compare its number to yours, and if it's going before you, it picks from the tableau based on a little number in the center of the card that is its appeal value. It's basically an AI mechanism that, to be fair, means that the virtual players add a little bit of competition in the game that you wouldn't normally get. You might think with something like this that two players is, well, there's not much competition, it's just me and you. No, you've got two other computer players, effectively, screwing up your day. It could be four computer players if you want to play just two of you but with six players. And it'd be quite, quite, it's quite interesting when you try it that way. But believe me, I've tried. But, like I say, you've still got to control those players, you've still got to do what they do. And so, the game length can be cut down to an extent, but... Here's the biggest negative with this game. The scoring. I once talked about on a review of Bunny Kingdom that I've got on my shelf. Now, I always said that the one flaw I had with Bunny Kingdom is that you played through an engaging drafting round and then the game ground to a halt as you scored up. And then it went on again, da 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 and I, it's ground to a halt again because you got to score and there's a lot of stuff you got to score. It's that horrible thing I hate in scoring phases where you have to look all over what you've created and then try and count up a million different ways to score. This is no exception. In fact, it is, it is possibly a killer for this game. I'm counting 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13 different ways that you can score. Now, some of them are the same as each other, but they involve different symbols. So you can argue that you can put them together, but you're still talking 13 different ways. And even if you do combine some together, you're probably talking 10 different ways. You might shave off three rows max. It's a lot of different things you've got to score. But the way they score usually involve you looking at the map that you've created. Bearing in mind, these are small tile maps and the symbols are small and you're looking at a lot of them. So you're having to do loads of math counting. And I mean a lot. You know, the first one, ranches. You score one point for every um, parcel that's adjacent to your hex, and this includes diagonals, so the whole thing, that's empty. So every ranch that you've got, you've got to go one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, six, 13, uh, da, 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 21, you know, and, and then give a number. You've got to do that for every single row. Next up, right, how many mountains do you have adjacent to your mines? They're worth two each, okay? A drugstore, how many houses do you have around it? They're worth one each, but two each for the townhouses. Count all those up. Uh, bear in mind the general store is not a tag store, you know, get that right. Okay, now the banks. Again, count all the houses that surround your banks. Saloon, again, count all the houses that surround your saloon, except there were two now. There's so much scoring that I swear to God, a six player game I did of this where six human players are around the table, as engaging and fun as the general game was, when it got to scoring, I swear the scoring took a third of the game length. It was that bad. Even with each person counting their own thing and mistakes were made because it's hard to remember what the scoring is. Because for some stupid reason, they did not put a reference guide in the box. No! You have to rely on the back page of the rule book to remind you what the scoring is. Now, you know, this game has only just come out. You can argue you might be able to go onto Board Game Geek and print out some files to help with the scoring. You know, print out a reference guide, or you could photocopy the rule book. But you shouldn't have to do this. In the retail copy of a game, for people who may not have gone onto Board Game Geek, or don't know about the resources on there, like you can print off files that people have submitted, or maybe just don't, you know, want to go through the hassle of having to photocopy a page from a rule book and put it in there and laminate it so it doesn't get destroyed, you know, that kind of thing. Why did they not put a reference guide in the box? It would have been so simple. Just simply one reference sheet that tells you how all the scoring happens 
and not just simply the iconography, tell you what it does. So number of ranches times whatever symbol equals whatever points, you know, that sort of thing. The reference guides they give you in here are not all that useful, to be perfectly honest. I mean, let's see if I can find, yeah, the reference ones. Literally, and this is another pet peeve, four languages in this game, four languages, they give you two reference cards for like two players worth of reference cards per language. So if you're playing with six, okay, uh, hello, we can play with six players. Why is there not six English references or six French or six German? Why is there only two of each? What is the point? And the only thing the reference card tells you is the order in which certain characters resolve if you use them at the same time. Okay, that doesn't tend to happen very often, you know, could that have not just been in the rule book? And the distribution of the symbols on cards. Now that is useful. You need to know that kind of thing because you need to not put all your eggs in one basket in the wrong era. But where's the scoring reference card? Where's the symbology reference card? Where's the iconography Western, uh, reference card? There isn't even anything on these reference cards that tells you what symbol means you score for adjacency and which one means you don't. So when if you get new players into this game, and I certainly do not consider this a gateway game as a result of all the iconography you've got to learn in this, but I had people who play games in this, and even I was like going, Okay, wait a minute, which one does that do again? Hang on, let me just check the rule book again. Oh, you know, right, okay. So I'm here perpetually looking at this rule book, reading out to people what all the characters and what all the things do. Because again, the character iconography is not crystal clear. There are some really confusing ones in there. And again, they're only printed at the back of a rule book that you have to pass around all the time or get one person to constantly interrupt his game so that he can check it all. Where's the reference card for that? Or better still, why not put a little bit of text on the card underneath the icon that tells you what it does? Deus did this. Terraforming Mars, I think, even did this. Now, come on. It's not a difficult thing to do, and it really should have been on there. So to summarize, Carson City, the card game. The best I can really give it personally is about a six, and that's been slightly generous. I still think the mechanics of this game are fun. They're not it's not like the best thing ever, but you know, they are still quite fun and it's engaging, but the player count, again, you're gonna restrict one to six players. This isn't something I would really be that desperate to play solo, but I will try it. I'll give it a, a I have not played the solo mode, I will say, but you know, it looks interesting. You basically just play yourself with three virtual players. It could work. You build a little city, you got a bit of competition. So that's cool. Two or three players, again, will be kept to a decent time length and will keep going. But five and six players will take too long and the scoring will make you want to gouge your own eyes out. You know, it will make you feel pain in, not a, in no way of a nice sense can you, you know, not even like masochists out there are going to want this kind of pain. <laughs> they really are not. So, you like I say, it's docked a lot of marks because of the frustrating graphic design, the lack of reference aids, the lack of thought and care that seems to have gone into making it easy for people to sort of get into it and play, and just the mad scoring that you have to do at the end. It's too much scoring. They could have streamlined this a lot more, and I feel that they bloated it too much for what is meant to be a simple card game. So six is about as best as I can give it personally. I'm still gonna hang on to it for now, but I need to find some way to make that scoring a lot simpler and iron out those little wrinkles. And I've got to be choosy who I play this with as well. So it's a bit of a letdown in that regard. Great game in terms of mechanics and the, you know, the, the city building and the auction cards, but a lot of frustrations that are going to really irk you in some pretty big ways. I hope that the Carson City big box version isn't as fiddly or as, you know, frustrating as this one has been at times. I'm hoping that one is a smoother experience, but the only way I'm gonna find out is to get it played. So that's it for me on this Broken Reaper review. I'll see you next time. If you like what you see, please subscribe to the channel, give me your feedback, mention stuff in the comments. I like to debate with you all day long. But remember, even if you do want to rip your eyes out for having to score so much, just remember, it's only a game. Goose rubber, calm down. So that's it for me. See you on the next episode. Take care, and I'll see you soon.